Hello and welcome. My name is Matthew Hershey. I'm on the faculty at Duke University. And in preparation for the American Diabetes Association virtual uh, annual symposium, we are doing a special Meet the Speakers sessions um, with three speakers from the uh, Insulin Action uh, session that I will uh, be chairing uh, later this week. Um, our first uh, Meet the Speaker is Isha Jane. So Isha is currently a Sandler faculty fellow at UCSF. Um, she did her undergraduate work um, at MIT and uh, at, with uh, Vamsi Mutha at Mass General Hospital. Um, she did a, a very short postdoc with him. And then directly, essentially out of graduate school, she joined the faculty uh, at UCSF to start her lab there. And so I'm quite excited to talk to Isha today a little bit about her work and giving us a, a bit of a teaser and a preview of the uh, work that she will be talking about um, in her session later this week at the ADA. So um, uh, Isha, thank you for joining me. How are you today? I'm doing well. Good morning. Um, thanks for having me. It's, this is a fun format to try out. So uh, I'm excited for our talk. Uh, me too. So, um, well, let's just um, get right into it. So um, I want to know a, a little bit about you and a little bit about the science um, that you like to think about and some of the scientific themes um, that you're exploring uh, in your own lab now. Yeah, um, so we're really starting to get excited about understanding how we as humans and organisms interact with our environment. Um, and so a large part of the lab is interested in how oxygen that we breathe and how levels of oxygen affect our metabolism and physiology. And so we call this the Goldilocks principle of oxygen, where too little or too much oxygen is a bad thing. And then we're now starting to move also in the direction of vitamin metabolism. So thinking about how diet and nutrition also interacts with our genetic makeup um, and affects disease progression. So Goldilocks principle of interacting with the environment. How did you get interested in oxygen? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think we were talking about this during uh, the last session, but people typically don't think about oxygen as a metabolite, right? So people think of it as just this uh, gas that exists in our atmosphere and there's not much more uh, to it. Um, and so I was probably also thinking about it in, in along those lines, um, but in, I was actually interested in mitochondrial biology and mitochondrial disease and kind of chanced about uh, upon the connection with oxygen. And so it's sort of a circuitous path that led me here. But then the more I read about it, uh, the more I excited, more excited I got about all of these unanswered questions in the field, um, especially pertaining to what happens when there's too much oxygen in the body. So then take us back. Um, you said you sort of discovered this or you happened upon this by chance. So take us back um, and rewind the clock for us. Um, what was sort of the understanding um, of oxygen and its role in physiology when you started um, thinking about this and when you started reading about it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and so typically people think about oxygen as a very good thing, right? The more oxygen you give to a person, the better. Um, and typically low oxygen is considered detrimental, right? So whether it's a stroke or a heart attack or respiratory failure, it's always low oxygen, bad, high oxygen, good. And you can actually see this, for example, uh, here in San Francisco, if you go to Pier 39, they have these oxygen bars uh, where you can uh, basically sit down and there's this uh, mask that they put on your face and they give you flavored oxygen. Um, and so they actually keep trying to do this to me every time I walk by, I'm like, wait a minute, hold on, um, and give them a little bit of a lecture. Uh, but this just goes to show that there's this mentality that uh, oxygen is a good thing. Um, and so that's, I think, where the field was, generally speaking, when I started uh, thinking about these types of questions. And I think now with our work and uh, the work of others in the context of MI and ICU clinical trials, uh, people are starting to realize that it's not just about um, too much oxygen being good. It's more about finding the ideal set point for oxygen. So perhaps you could then uh, move a research site down to Pier 39 and you have a, a, <laughs> a subjects that would be uh, ready and willing to... Vanilla flavored oxygen. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so let's get a little bit more into the science now. So um, when you started um, uh, studying this and, and you were trying to identify some of the gaps in knowledge, um, what was that like and how did you decide what approaches um, that you would take? And, and when, again, you just dive into the science a little bit and tell us um, the, the approach that you decided to take. Yeah, um, so my background is a little bit more systems biology, computer science, more quantitative biology. Um, at least that's the way I like to think about things. 
Um, and so I like the idea of taking these modern methods and frameworks and applying them to historical scientific questions, right? So digging into the literature, reading a paper from 50 years ago, and then saying, how can we answer this question perhaps in a slightly different way using modern methodologies? Um, and so a lot of my earlier work uh, was done right around the time when genome-wide CRISPR screens were first becoming available. And so that really enabled us to answer some of these questions in a more creative and novel way that might have been possible possible even five or 10 years ago. Um, and so that's, that's how that project started. All right. So tell us a little bit about the, about the screen then. How did, how did you think about setting this up? Because as I understand, when performing some of these screens, um, asking the, the right question, setting up the screen in the right way, uh, turns out to be tremendously important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the reality of it is, is we probably tried a few different types of screens back then, and we ran with the one that worked. Um, so this is early days, right? I think the first CRISPR screens had just been published or were about to be published. And so it was definitely a lot of trial and error. Um, but in general, when designing these types of approaches, the, the readout is really important. Um, and the experimental design and the amount of selective pressure that you impose on your question. Um, and so in this case, you know, it was somewhat straightforward. We wanted to model mitochondrial dysfunction in a dish, and there's sort of standard ways to do this using inhibitors. Um, but I think in the last even four or five years, people have tried even more creative readouts and ways to think about genome-wide screens. Um, and so I think people have gotten even more creative with the tools that they use in this setting. And then so um, I, I, we've already recorded our session um, for the ADA symposium, so I had a little bit of uh, inside knowledge into um, some of the results of, of your screens. Um, but you uh, described how you pulled out one of the major oxygen sensors um, uh, from uh, the screen that you, the early screen that you did. Um, so tell us about that, that sort of moment of discovery. What did that Eureka moment look like? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely an exciting moment. Um, you know, when you do this, uh, I, I talk about it with my students as being, uh, you know, when you get the results of a genome-wide approach, whether it's a screen or a high-throughput data set, you know, there's all this buildup for months where you prep <laughs> samples and, you know, do all this troubleshooting. And then the day you get the data set, when you're analyzing it, it's like this moment of like unwrapping a, a Christmas present. You have no idea whether it's going to be a pair of socks or like, you know, uh, the next cool video game, not that I play video games, but, um, and so there was definitely that moment when I first analyzed that genome wide screen. Um, but I think that like real eureka moment came from the animal work uh, when we exposed these mitochondrial disease mice to hypoxia and found that they lived very long. Um, and I think that was probably the real eureka moment. Um, it was sort of a random experiment. It was motivated by the science, but it was, you know, wasn't really expecting it to work. Um, and so that was definitely this like ecstatic moment. Um, and I don't know if this is the exact moment of the discovery, but I remember I was working with a collaborator um, on this project and he was uh, taking care of the mice when I was uh, on vacation in Colorado. So I was hiking with some friends in the mountains in Denver, um, which is That'd ironic. Be <laughs> yes, I was a little bit hypoxic. And I was just trying to read about oxygen and hypoxia. Um, and I was texting this collaborator who's looking after these mice that were in this hypoxia chamber. And he was like, I think they're doing well. Like, you know, like, I think it's working. And so every time we went hiking, I'd say, okay, we're at this meter's altitude. Like, how much oxygen is that? Um, so anyway, I have a good, sort of a rough memory of, of that moment. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the big splash um, back then. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Um, so now th thinking a little bit more about current day. And so um, you have these sort of groundbreaking and seminal studies uh, showing that uh, modulating oxygen delivery can influence um, uh, survival and disease uh, pathogenesis uh, and progression, um, which is, is remarkable. And um, you've also now nominated several uh, mitochondrial diseases that, um, that could be benefited uh, from this. Um, what do you think are some of the major uh, questions in the field um, so moving forward after some of these um, these groundbreaking discoveries? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, you know, I think the initial result was a little bit phenomenological, right? So we're still trying to figure out why this is working. Um, but then, you know, this, these are also the rare inborn errors of metabolism. And so I think we're really excited as a lab to now figure out whether this extends beyond this complex one deficiency, the specific mutation, et cetera, and take it in the more general direction. Um, we're also really interested in applying this concept to um, the setting of like age-associated neurodegeneration um, and trying to see if we can sort of find commonalities between this approach 
um, and maybe other longevity interventions. And so I think trying to understand whether this is relevant for more common conditions is definitely an important open question, trying to figure out why this is working um, and sort of the opposite side of that coin is why is too much oxygen a bad thing? Um, I think people often equate uh, hyperoxia or oxygen with ROS um, and sort of bundle that all together as this uh, phenomena where you throw antioxidants um, at a disease and that's all that you can do. Um, but we think there's a lot more sort of nuances to the question of oxygen toxicities, trying to figure out which pathways um, are affected. And then how does the body know that there's too much or too little oxygen? Um, you know, the, the HIF pathway has been fairly well studied on the low oxygen side, but what is the body doing to recognize too much oxygen? How is it adapting, if at all? Um, and how can we hijack those stress responses to our benefit? I just threw a bunch of random questions at you. <laughs> no, no, that was that was a, a quite comprehensive um, uh, sort of picture. Um, but I'll ask you now just to simplify it um, for us. So, so what is uh, in your mind, maybe for your lab, like what does the next eureka moment look like? What is the next thing that if you put your finger on it, you say, "I would really like to know," what is it? Uh, hmm. Why is oxygen toxic? All right. Well, there we have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that we can um, uh, both uh, tune into your ADA talk uh, to get a sense for that, but then also we'll um, sure be sure to uh, keep track of some of your work. Um, so just in a, a couple of final questions of just um, thinking about the future. Um, so uh, you um, are, are still uh, what I would say quite a young scientist, um, quite accomplished uh, for your uh, scientific career. What advice would you give then uh, to young scientists who either want to get into um, either oxygen physiology or would want to get into metabolism or um, uh, more broadly into uh, human physiology, especially related um, to a disease? Um, what, what advice would you give? Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's sort of practical advice. Um, so it's not, yeah, I would say that project planning is extremely important. Um, and so spending a lot of time upfront thinking about the types of questions you want to answer, I think is extremely important, both at the graduate student level or at the postdoc level or at the PI level. Um, and so at least for me, I always get excited by this combination of basic science translation. Um, and so in my mind, I always think that like solving this like, Rubik's cube of science is important, right? Like turn the turn the cube until all the colors match up. Um, and then at the same time, I really want to have biomedical impact. So I know that those are the, the questions and the approaches that really drive me to get up in the morning and charge full speed ahead. Um, and so I think figuring that out for yourself, you know, what does that balance look like for you? And then designing projects accordingly is important. Um, I think diversifying risk is important at the sort of research program level. So, you know, you want to do the high risk, high reward kind of crazy experiments. But from a practical standpoint, you also need to be uh, cognizant of like the time frame at which you're operating. And so having multiple projects going, keeping them organized, et cetera, is really important. Um, and then I think having like a thick science skin, if that, if that makes sense, not, not necessarily thick skin personality wise, but a thick science skin, right? Like not getting uh, bogged down by individual experiments not working or sort of like the minor annoyances in science and just kind of shoving it to the side and being like, no, I like, want to do my science and I'll do what it takes to get there. Uh, so kind of a you know, charge full speed ahead mentality, I think helps. So then one, one final question. So then um, from, from a managerial perspective or from a lab PI perspective, how do you find the next young Isha to then recruit <laughs> and enter our situation. lab? Um, yeah. Uh, so I have, I, I would say that I'm pretty picky about hiring um, and obviously because it's a new lab, um, but I definitely look for passion, right? So the person who asks a million questions during interviews, the person who sends me an email at 10 p.m. saying, oh, I just thought of this crazy new idea. Um, and I, I typically actually ask all of my students and postdocs to write like a mini one page proposal of what they would want to work on in the lab if they were to join. Um, and so I want to feel intellectually sort of stimulated with con during conversations with the people that I hire. And so I think that's my guiding principle. And obviously that they, they better be nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with uh, with several of those points. So, okay. Well, um, I want to, again, thank you um, for your time. Um, I am looking forward to um, airing our, our session that we pre-recorded. Um, you have some very exciting science. I would encourage everybody um, to, uh, to join and to watch along. So uh, thank you, Isha. Yeah, my pleasure.
My pleasure. This is fun.